Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay coming to you today from Penn Valley, Pennsylvania, carrying on our discussion with Edward S. Herman. Edward is an American economist and media analyst with a specialty in corporate and regulatory issues, as well as the political economy and the media. He's a professor emeritus of finance at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, and he co-authored Manufacturing Consent with Noam Chomsky, and recently The Politics of Genocide. Thanks for joining us again. Glad to be with you, Paul. The whole way that military intervention, by the United, mainly by the United States, has been dressed up as humanitarian, liber liberating, but primarily more recently humanitarian. And, and there used to be, at least in, in, in international law, the concept of self-determination and non-interfering in another country's internal affairs. And not that I don't know anybody really, really followed it, at least it was a norm that was supposed to be followed. And that seems to have disappeared now with this idea that if you can get enough countries on board and say there's a humanitarian crisis, you can intervene. This became a very important issue for you. So why and speak about it. Well, because the interventions were so outrageous. And I, uh, I, I, I've been driven to quite an extent in my long career as a writer by outrage. I mean, there have been so many outrages. And the humanitarian intervention era is a new era of outrages. As a matter of fact, it, it, the, the development of humanitarian intervention as a concept is actually essentially an overthrow of international law. The UN Charter, that system, was designed to protect sovereign states against aggression. If you look at the Charter, it's really a charter outlawing international aggression. So along comes humanitarian intervention, and you, that's actually a cover for a de facto aggression. I mean, to some extent, this came out of the Nuremberg trials, did it not? Oh, yes. The oh, yes. The highest Absolutely. crime is, is, yes. is, is yes. war against... Yes, yes. Yeah, the, yeah, the, and the Robert, we, I've always quoted Robert Jackson, where he, he describes aggression as the, the, the... And the Nuremberg laws, the Nuremberg... Uh, trial findings mention aggression as the main crime with war crimes kind of following on and derivative from that fundamental crime. Okay, now just one moment. For any of the younger people watching this interview, if you don't know what the Nuremberg trials are, you better hit pause right now and get on Wikipedia and go read what the Nuremberg trials are because these are the trials that took place after the Second World War where the Nazi leaders of the Nazi party were put on trial for crimes against humanity and and the crime of aggression which is what led so, to this idea yes, that don't interfere yes, in other countries yeah. so and here when the united states wants to go after yugoslavia it uh it it just it's engaged it, it, it built up a whole arsenal of claims about the crimes being committed by the Yugoslav government against the, the, the various peoples of the of Yugoslavia, so we therefore have to go in and bomb as part of a humanitarian operation, and of course also the uh, responsibility to to protect the R2P doctrine came into play, and in, in this same time horizon. We have a responsibility to protect those poor civilians in countries where their, their, uh, their leaders are doing damage to them. This gives right to, to engage in what might be aggression if it's just a cover. I'm, and in fact, under the modern propaganda systems, it's extremely easy to uh, find eth ethnic groups in practically any country that are engaging in an uprising. You can actually subsidize them and encourage them. And in fact, in the case of Yugoslavia, it's it's um, it's a well established fact, for example, that in Kosovo, the CIA was in Kosovo actually training and encouraging the Kosovo Albanians so that that they should do something. And we were going to come and help them. The same thing was true of the Bosnian Muslims. We uh, actually, in, Bo in the Bosnian case, culminating, of course, in, in the Srebrenica massacre and the Dayton Accords, in that case, actually, all the parties had agreed 
to, uh, to a, a settlement, the so-called Lisbon Agreement back in 1992, and the Bosnian Muslim head withdrew at, on, on, with advice from the U.S. ambassador saying maybe he could do better. So here you had a settlement that would have, that would have pre prevented the, the serious ethnic cleansing, mutual ethnic cleansing that followed and the Srebrenica massacre. It was, it was sabotaged. This is supposed to be a fundamental principle. Yes. Not to interfere. Yes. Then why even get into the ins and outs of whether the U.S. instigated this or didn't instigate that or whether this crime is committed or not committed? Because I, when I look at the debate about this, a lot of it winds up digging into did they really commit such crimes, meaning the Serbian government or if you want the Libyans or whoever, or didn't they? Whereas the, if, if the issue is an issue of principle, then is the issue that it doesn't matter whether they did or they didn't, external players should just stay the hell out. Can you ever imagine a situation? I mean, let's say there was an uprising in Saudi Arabia and the Saudis started slaughtering. In other words, a pro-American government yeah. started slaughtering its peoples. Is there a situation there where, where you would have an ex, uh, some kind of responsibility to protect? Or is it simply you say you, everyone stays out no matter what? Well, I'm, I'm against it and that kind of intervention altogether to, because it's so easily abused and because it falls so easily as it has been. It, it and the humanitarian intervention have both been used strictly for the interests of the United States and other Western powers and Israel. Strictly. So there's no intervention in Saudi Arabia or Israel or any, or uh, Yemen or Bahrain. There was none in Egypt. Because well, there was intervention in Bahrain on the side of the Yes, government. yes, that's right. Well, that was the Saudis, actually the Saudis, the United States and the UN never came in. And there was, but Egypt is, a, here you had a, a miserable dictator for decades, and then you had an uprising where a lot of people were being beaten and killed in the streets, and you never had uh, Mrs. Clinton ever asking for any application of humanitarian intervention, not not once, never. They're getting away with the most unbelievable double standard imaginable. They're using, the, as you, there is the principles, the UN principles, non-intervention non in sovereign states. But th th we now have this phony humanitarian cover of responsibility to protect human that covers over the desire to violate the UN Charter, which we have been doing on a fairly systematic basis. And this, this was also true in the Libyan case, that they even got the ICE, the International uh, Criminal Court Guide to rush in to declare uh, we need to, uh, the responsibility to protect those Libyan civilians. It was done it almost overnight, overnight, which shows the, 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 perf the function of the UN and the, IC the ICC these days. And we see uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia calling for the same thing now in Syria. Yeah, oh yes, and they're intervening pretty fairly heavily in, in Syria. Um, but in this case, Russia and China, Russia has drawn a line and, and, and the Syrian government is more powerful and capable of resisting than, than the, uh, and the we Libyan never, government. We never saw the Americans using responsibility to protect with the Chechens in Russia. No. Which, it's all geopolitics. When it's oh, in your yes, interest, uh, you bring out that card, and when it's not, you don't. No, absolutely. And the, the lack of principle involved, the lack of, it, you, as you say, there is a principle, the UN principle, that's been overridden by this allegedly higher principle of the responsibility to protect civilians who are victimized by their government so that we have to go in. And that we did the we did this in Libya, and the, uh, and the <clears throat> a good chunk of the left fell for this too. We have the responsibility. I raised, we raised the question. I have raised the question. In the case of Libya, well, uh, do you want to leave this in the hands of the United States? It's engaging in drone warfare all over the world. It's declared the whole world a free fire zone. It, it engaged in the most monstrous aggression in, in Iraq, and, and it's it got away with. You want, you want this imperial power? 
power to, to, to do the job in, in Libya on this high, to incredibly selective basis? To, isn't that a bad principle itself to let them to do it and to let them do it? And to, to have faith that they're going to do it, not engage in regime change, which they've been obviously pursuing. I mean, the naivete behind supporting that is, is again, it's breathtaking. We'll go further in the next segment of our interview series. So please join us for the next segment of our interview with Edward, Edward S. Herman on The Real News Network.